You've probably heard these three quotes at some point in your life. Go big or go home. Bigger isn't always better. And just because it works on paper doesn't mean it'll work in practice. These are disturbingly befitting of the locomotives that are the subject of this episode. One that you have begged me to make ever since I uploaded my 8 ESF 2 1010 video. I am of course talking about the triplex locomotives. The wait is over. Articulated steam locomotives were new to American railroads in the 19-teens, since the country's first was built in 1904, for the Baltimore and Ohio by the American Locomotive Company. By then, they were making a massive impact on freight rail transportation. The reason being, for one, articulates were so powerful that for a train needing two non-articulated locomotives, like 282 Mikados to move, articulates could muscle the same load unassisted, thus eliminating the need for double-heading, and along with it, extra crews to pay, since steam locomotives do need one per locomotive to operate in sync. Two, the dual-frame concept with six to eight driving wheels per frame made them more flexible around curves than non-articulates with eight, ten, or twelve driving wheels, depending on the wheel arrangement. Thus, locomotives like two 662s and two 882s could negotiate tight curves that non-articulates with 10, 12, or more driving wheels couldn't, otherwise just tighter curves. The result was that articulates were more efficient for heavy trains, both financially and physically in some cases. Railroads and locomotive builders were pushing the concept to its absolute limits in that decade. Such pushes included the Santa Fe's unsuccessful two 10-10-2s and jointed boiler locomotives. And then there was the Erie Railroad, who was looking for a locomotive to muscle lengthening freight trains over the steep grades of Gulf Summit in south-central New York. Fortunately for them, America's top-tier locomotive manufacturer, the Baldwin Locomotive Works, had just an idea for them, which was also another experimental articulated design they had patented in 1914. This said design by Baldwin engineer George R. Henderson is what came to be the Triplex. It used three engine units instead of the typical two for an articulated locomotive. The third unit was connected using a hinge pin to the back of the second frame, but unlike the first two, it was underneath the tender along with the trailing bogey. Erie would order one triplex from Baldwin in 1914, named Matt H. Shea, numbered 5014, and two more nameless ones later that year, 5015 and 5016, all designated P1s. Meanwhile, the Virginian Railway that ran in the Southern Virginias followed suit, ordering a single triplex, also from Baldwin, in 1916, numbered 700, and designated XA. Both designs were compound, or true, malaise, and monsters. The coal-fired Erie locomotives came each with a 28882 wheel arrangement, and the oil-fired Virginian XA, a 28882. Four. In terms of specifications, the Erie P1s had a 91-foot wheelbase with a tractive effort of 176,256 pounds, weighing 585 U.S. tons, 36 by 32 inch cylinders, 16 tons of coal, and 11,600 gallons of water. As for the physically slimmer, though slightly longer, Virginian XA respectively, a 91 and a quarter foot wheelbase, 146,000 to 187,000 pounds rounded, depending on the source, 421 US tons, 34 by 32 inch cylinders, 12,000 gallons of oil, 13,000 gallons of water. Technically, they would be considered the largest tank engines ever made since their tenders were more like huge bunkers and water tanks that were not separable from the locomotives, just like on typical tank engines. But it meant nothing in the end. Like Train of Thought said, and I paraphrase, it isn't how big, but how well designed your locomotive is. In fact, the Matt H. Shea had a really rough start in revenue freight service. When originally built, its freight area measured 90 square feet, which is roughly the same as Van Swearingen Berkshire's, like Pier Marquette 1225. That wasn't big enough for the P1. 
Like Christopher Kovacs said, it resulted in the 5014 frequently running out of steam on Gulf Summit grade, thus forcing other trains in the division to stop for several minutes so that the triplex could get its boiler pressure back up. That issue was swiftly fixed by rebuilding the Mat 8 Shea with a larger 122 square foot firebox that the nameless 5015 and 16 would be built with from the get go. But even with Chesapeake and Ohio T1 sized fireboxes, the problems didn't end. The biggest issue was the rear engine units under the tender, which is also why you don't put the driving wheels there. Now, it did increase traction and equate to a good adhesive factor of 4.32, but I can only imagine it being true when the tender was fully loaded. As the locomotives consumed fuel, it gradually got lighter and lighter, which meant that the back unit was slowly losing adhesive weight. If you've taken high school physics, you may remember Newton's third law of motion, which is, for every force an object applies to another object, the other exerts an equivalent force in the opposite direction. Something as simple as walking is an example of it. The reason you aren't slipping is because the force that you're applying is creating friction in the opposite direction to keep you from slipping. Unless you're on a surface with a low coefficient of friction, like say, ice. Trains need friction so their wheels can get enough grip on the track. There are many ways in which they can do this. One such way, also from physics, is the formula for friction. Friction, in a basic application, is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force of the object. Normal force is the force opposing gravitational force, or weight, and in the case of an object moving on a level surface, is equal to the mass, not weight, times gravity, which can also just equal weight. So then really, in the basic case of a locomotive, the frictional force is equal to the mass times gravity times the coefficient of friction, or weight times coefficient of friction. That, by the way, is the ratio of resistive force of friction divided by the normal force, and in the case of railroad operation, in steel wheels on steel rails, between 0.35 and 0.50. So eventually, the triplex's third engine unit gradually ran out of gravitational force, or in this case, adhesive weight, and thus friction to properly grip the rails. And once they did, the engine unit was prone to violent wheel slip, while the front two units continued to grip the track with the same adhesive weight as what they had started with as a typical steam locomotive. As in, the driving wheels being placed under the boiler. It was a repeat of the 1846 Nikol locomotive from the Reading, which was which also had terrible adhesion resulting from the boiler being mounted on the tender instead of the driving wheels, thus depriving the locomotive of adhesion. Consequently, the triplex's adhesion factor may have also declined over time. Now it is true that articulated steam locomotives tended to be a little more prone to wheel slip than non-articulated ones. Some did have lower adhesion factors than the ideal 4.0, but even in the case of the triplex's wheel slip, it was abnormal compared to even four-cylinder articulated. That adhesion factor would have surely gone below 4.0 once they ran out of grip. Consequently, Erie downgraded the P1s to being used as helper locomotives on Gulf Summit so that their fuel could be replenished following every run up the hill. Even then, the third unit was still more trouble than it was worth. Because the locomotives used six cylinders instead of the typical four, it meant they were consuming about one and a half times the amount of steam they would have if they were just normal four-cylinder articulated, maybe up to two times because of the wheel slip, and because they were compound articulated. But in this unique case, it meant that steam was first being fed into the high-pressure cylinders in the middle, then the steam from the right side HP cylinder was fed into the low-pressure HP cylinder, while the steam from the left was being fed into the rear cylinders before finally being shot out of individual stacks at each end. Yes, they had stacks at each end. It was that ridiculous. 
but because they'd be using one and a half to two times the amount of steam they would have if they were four cylinder locomotives, they exhausted all of it so quickly they could only reach speeds of up to 10 miles an hour or 16 kilometers per hour, which is two thirds the maximum speed of the Santa Fe 3002 1010-2s. Imagine blowing huge gashes in the steam pipes of a Norfolk and Western Y so that not all of the steam gets to the front cylinders and thus loses it. That's kind of what was happening in the triplexes. Yes, I literally meant triplexes, not just the eerie ones. As for the Virginian XA triplex, which had a larger boiler, well, it had the same problems as the eerie locomotives. Do the same reasons, except it was even worse because it could only reach a max speed of 5 miles an hour, or 8 kilometers per hour. Since jogging speed can reach up to 6 miles per hour, a normal human could outrun these things. Even the Santa Fe 3000s could do something as simple as start a 150 to 200 car train faster than the XA could. It also suffered from steam leakage from the stuffing boxes of the tender cylinders, which obstructed the crew's vision from the cab. Baldwin even had personnel on hand to work on the 700s problems, but had little success. The railroad hated the XA. Finally, all of the triplexes were too powerful for couplers and rolling stock at that time, and trains weren't as long as they get today, let alone enough to justify this madness of power. The 5014 even proved this by breaking one of the couplers of a 250 car train 17 miles into the run. This further proves that the triplexes could only be used reliably as helper locomotives. All four locomotives were quickly deemed failures, and just after four years of service, the Virginian XA was sent back to Baldwin rebuilt into a 2880 with the back engine unit removed, the locomotive fitted with a new separable tender on bogies, renumbered to 610, and redesignated AF. The remains of the third engine unit were converted into an MD type 2A2 Mikado, numbered 410. Both locomotives were now fine, and resumed operation on the Virginian until 1953, with the AF becoming a 2882 along the way. Both were sadly cut up as was also the case with almost every steam locomotive on the Virginian. The Erie locomotives were eventually displaced when the railroad began taking order of new Van Swearingen Berkshires from Alco and Lima beginning in 1927. All three were, unsurprisingly, cut up by 1933. Baldwin's proposal of a 28882 for the Denver and Rio Grande Western, and even more insane quadruplex locomotives, rapidly dissolved in response to the triplexes failing. Unlike the Santa Fe's 3000s, which were clearly Santa Fe's fault, it's safe to say that the triplexes were more so Baldwin's fault. It was their idea, their design, but an experimental one with some thought, even if they turned out worse than the more ridiculous 3000s. It would set the stage for future engineering boundaries of articulated locomotives, since nobody has ever attempted making a triplex since 1916, except in model train formed by model companies, but that's a different world. Future articulated all over the world have since been built with two frames and four cylinders. Belgium did make a quadruplex that was no way related to the design of the Baldwin ones, but that's another story. The triplexes, although the largest steam locomotives of their time, quickly lost their titles to more successful four-cylinder dual-framed wheel arrangements, and later, the king of steam himself, Big Boy. They went down in history as one of the most extreme and unique engineering experiments in railroad history, even if they were among the biggest flops that contributed to making railroad culture the way it is, for the greater good of everyone. And as one of several machines that failed spectacularly in toppling Big Boy from his throne. With that conclusion, one of your biggest requests for me has finally come true two years following the sparks that set it in motion. If you enjoyed, like, subscribe, 
and remember to activate notifications so that you don't miss future uploads like this. Also check out my ATSF 3000 video and other similar if you wish. I'm the Rocket City Rail Fan, also known as Andrew Rail of Amers. Thank you for the wait, and thank you for watching!